Um, I think there's more people who wanted to come, or at least according to chat, but um, I think we should just get started. Uh, thanks everybody for showing up to this talk. My name is Christoph Wickert. Um, I used to be very active in Fedora. Um, I used to be a package maintainer, ambassador, FAMSCO member, FESCO member, board member, council member and whatnot. Uh, that's what I'm going to talk about tomorrow, about my decade in Fedora. Um, now I'm going to talk about documentation because I joined the uh, SUSE documentation team uh, a little over two years ago. And yeah, technical writing is my profession now. I've been writing technical documentation at Colab before, but uh, yeah, I'm going to tell you some basic rules about technical writing and these rules are not only f uh, they not only apply to documentation but you can use them anywhere you want you can use them for example in bug reports you can use them even in in technical emails so i would argue that technical language is more or less the same of course there's there's more to documentation um but for now we just s stick to the basic rules i suggest So I've made it six basic rules. After that, uh, I can give you, um, we, we can have a question and answer session. And at the very end, I can give you some sources, unfortunately not all, but we have more sources on the web uh, for what I'm showing you now. All right, for a start, a little bit of fun. Avoid alliteration, always. That's from so these tips are from a website. Uh, first, I found them on Facebook. When I googled for them, I found them on a website called plainlanguage.gov, which is a very valuable resource that I would like to recommend to everybody who wants to, not only for technical documentation, but for any kind of plain language. So plainlanguage.gov holds, holds uh, plain language guides for various uh, institutions and organizations in the US but also so many resources about language and among them there's also a humor section where these rules are from and there's so much truth in there. Prepositions are not words to end sentences with. Avoid cliches like the plug, they are old hat. Comparisons are as bad as cliches. Be more or less specific. One should never generalize. Be consistent. Don't be redundant. Don't use more words than necessary. It's highly superfluous. Who needs rhetorical questions anyway? Exaggeration is a billion times worse than understatement. Don't use contractions. So that was just for fun. There's way more of these on this website. Uh, I can show you some, some of them later. Um, you don't need to fol all follow all of them, but there's certainly some truth in every in every of these rules. I think it's 70 in total. It's it's just funny. But I'm going to stick for. I mean, you cannot just make these. Uh, it's not enough to make the opposite of what I just told you. Um, but there are some some even more fundamental principles that you need to adhere. First, you need to change the perspective. Who's the best person to write? So imagine you're a developer. How many developers do we have in the room here? OK, basically most of you. Who's the best person to document the program or the code that you have written? You are, right? You know everything by heart. That's true, you're the best person, but you're also the worst person because you know everything by heart. 
you make assumptions about your code, you know everything, actually you don't even need documentation, just read the code. But that's not how it works. You need to learn to look at your program from a user's perspective and I know this is very difficult. That's why in, an, in a perfect world everybody has dedicated documentation writers like we have at SUSE. It's, it's similar to quality assurance. You shouldn't quality assure your own uh, program. You need to have a different point of view, you need to know the user's expectations, you need to know your audience, your target audience or your, your users. Um, it's a big difference if you're writing for system administrators or if you're writing for uh, other developers, if you're writing an API documentation for example. Um, there it's probably pretty easy for you to, to switch the point of view. But if, it, if it's try to think at, as a mere mortal desktop user who doesn't have a clue what's under the hood. So basically don't tell them how it works, tell them how to use it. That's all. They don't care about, if you have a car, they don't care about the engine. They want to drive. And they no need to know how to turn on the, the wipers or how to turn on the light, how to drive when there's snow, how to uh, change the oil. So just stick to what's important for your target audience. Try to find out who's your target audience. Maybe you have a clue about this, for example, from discussions on mailing lists or from bug reports. Um, if you are, I mean, sometimes just sometimes think you are also a user. If you file a bug against a program somebody else wrote, um, at that point you're a user of this program. So try to remember these situations and try to write from that perspective. But that's really the, the crucial part. And if you don't get your target audience right, uh, you won't get the documentation right. There are some hints to do that or some tricks. Uh, a lot of people use personas. I recall like in Fedora we did that too. Uh, we uh, On the Fedora homepage, I'm, I'm not sure if it's still online, but at some point on the Fedora homepage we had the different Fedora users. We were actually introducing them. So one is a professional uh, musician, the other is a sysadmin, the next one is a developer, but then you have a, a, a musician again and they all tell their user stories how they use Fedora. So it's all about persona and user stories. Um, a lot of people or a lot of, if you're into professional documentation writing, you try to, to really have these different personas, you write them up and uh, try to look at things from their perspective. Actually there's some people who even do real world user testing who don't make up these personas, these example users, but really have some, some users use their program and test it. But that's really, that's why I made it the rule number one. It's the most underlying, underlying rules of all. At SUSE implementation, um, we often define the target audience. At the very beginning of the documentation, we say this handbook was written for, and then you would line out, lay out administrators or users or whatnot. Okay, the next thing is a giant pile of information and you want to structure it somehow. So split it up into chunks. Um, first things first, what everybody needs to know, try to make a high level summary like say installation, setup, first time use, maintenance, whatever. These are the four, that would be the four chapters of your documentation. And then you go further down uh, into this hierarchy. Uh, I suggest to not have more than three levels of, uh, of uh, more than a three level hierarchy, but that should usually be enough. And within this uh, three level hierarchy, you should usually only have seven plus minus two items. Yes, I know sometimes this can be can be hard. Actually having more is not not necessarily a problem. If you have a consistent hierarchy, for example, I 
I recall a project that I was recently working on where we describe a lot of command uh, command line options. Um, yes, I think we ended up at 11, so that's clearly against Miller's law, but if your hierarchy, if your structure is consistent, then it's not really a problem. If you're having, uh, if you have something that needs to be executed in a certain order, make it a procedure. A procedure is usually numbered and a procedure shouldn't have more than 10 steps. If you have more, you can think about sub-steps. If, uh, well, first of all, you can combine steps. If, if the next step is just click OK, then you would just add it to the previous step. Um, if you have optional steps, that would be sub-steps that you can skip and you could actually inside a procedure you could also start using a hierarchy but I would recommend only using two levels there but again it's all about the structure if something is is unrelated then you can have basically well any structure you want you can st uh, skip stuff uh, going back to the the uh, example installation setup first time use maintenance whatever they can just jump in uh, on chapter 2 because the program is already installed they just need to set it up so here order doesn't matter but if order matters then make it a procedure and make sure you have numbers when you make this structure think about the readers goals the readers goals is usually get this stuff up and running or get this use it uh, have a, you have a certain certain purpose, uh, a certain goal that you want to achieve with this program. So, um, yeah, try to to do everything w with this structure from the reader's goals to it clearly achieve. Every point in the structure should help the user to achieve another goal. When, he has, he, when the user is finished reading chapter one, he should have installed the program. After ch uh, chapter 2 he should have set it up and so on. Um, when you have um, instructions you usually use the active voice. You address the user directly. I know there are programs that handle this differently. Um, for example GNOME usually uses the passive voice in all its translations. It's, it's a difference if you say do you use this file or should this file be deleted? In documentation, I would suggest to use an active voice because it's you are addressing the user directly. You need to install this program, not, not somebody else. If you say the program needs to be installed, then, well, it's not my business. No, you're clearly talking to the reader and that's why you use the active voice. As again, procedures with steps. If you have something difficult, make sure that the warning is before the step and not afterwards. Otherwise, uh, people may be very angry at you if they have screwed. I mean, if if things are okay, they have just screwed up that particular step and you need to start over again. If things go really south, they have deleted data and they are not happy at all. And uh, the same goes for background if information. For example, an architectural overview or, or what's an introduction. And of course, all of that has to go before the procedure. Again, before the procedure, you would say, you would clearly outline the goal. This procedure helps you to install that or to do that. And uh, if there's any additional information needed about the goal, if the goal is unclear or what, before it has to go before the procedure. And now, whatever you, now you actually start writing. At least that's what I hope. And uh, keep it simple, stupid. The KISS principle. We all know it. Um, use simple words. Um, that's not only simpler for you, but also for your readers. Um, you're probably not going to translate your documentation into different languages. So, and, and you're not necessarily a native English speaker. I mean, I'm not. 
um, I know a lot of people are here are not and probably your users won't be native speakers either so that's why you use a simple language and even if your documentation is translated, even if it's translated by professional translators, at SUSE we, we have certain documentation that is translated and certain documentation is not. But even if you have pr professional translators, using a simple language makes it easier for them. Bec you can be sure that the translated result is what you had actually in mind. So the KISS principle means you use simple words use instead of utilize, show instead of indicate, requirement instead of prerequisite. I mean there are lots of examples. Um, it's not about, we are not talking about winning a Nobel Prize here. It's not about that it, uh, that it sounds nice or that yes you should avoid, try to avoid duplications but on the other hand you shouldn't use uh, 10 different verbs or 10 different uh, words for the same thing that goes back to the be consistent that we had before um, then grammar, click OK, the printer dialog appears that's, that's straight forward, that's uh, I mean as simple as a sentence can be um, you have the noun you have uh, the verb there's it hardly can be any simpler try to only stick one idea into one sentence don't use complicated uh, sentence constructions um, before yada 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 after or something if you use something like that make sure to indicate it clearly if then before after first, second, not first, next, next, next. Again, there you would make a procedure first, second, third, finally, some for example. And try to avoid fillers. Um, there are so many fillers that you can avoid uh, that you just shouldn't be using. Um, if you read it over, you will find out better without, without, them. without them. Even if it sounds, if, if it doesn't sound natural at first because you think it's too simple, too simplistic. But again, simple is good. Be consistent, we just had that in the how to write good rules, but um, something that is very, very, very important. At SUSE we have the SUSE style guide and actually we have a terminology there, ac or in all projects that I've been working with, I've also been working with the XFCE and the LXSDE translations. I was the coordinator for the German translation team. So you usually have a dictionary or terminology to make sure you're consistent. And uh, it's, it's really surprising how many different words you can find uh, for the same thing or how many different spellings you can find for the same thing. So really try to be consistent here. Okay, um, parallel constructions, why white space is important. You see, it doesn't work here, right? Can You can hardly read the next lines. And that is not only because of the strike through, but it's also because we have totally different stuff here that is not really related. Um, again, if you are, let's let's go through it one by one. If you want to emphasize a certain sentence, make it a paragraph of its own, even if it's only a single sentence. There's nothing wrong with that. If it's if it's a step in a procedure, or if it's if it's something the user must not miss then it's definitely a paragraph of its own. So white space before and white space after helps to, to focus the attention. It uh, separates the different sections and ag again it helps you to, to break the content into the different chunks that I was talking about earlier. And now I'm coming back to plain language. Um, avoid interruptions. At Last year I was at a conference that is called Write the Docs in Prague and there was um, 
a guy who gave a very interesting talk about how our mind works and as most of you are uh, developers think of your think of our brain as a compiler or think of your your documentation like code um, the code needs to be readable or our brain needs to be able to compile it and in order to make that simple it's it's of course you can understand just look at the sentence they are not however marked as installed however they are not marked as installed it's not a big difference everybody here can understand both sentences but you will surely agree that the second sentence is simpler to understand because you you're not interrupting the the train of thought try to to avoid this wherever possible um, the next the same goes for fragile verbs shut the server down no shut down the server it's as simple as that even if it only takes a microsecond if you only save a microsecond even if it only makes this single sentence a, a tiny bit easier to understand there's there's a lot of potential and they actually made tests uh, when it comes to understanding or, or the reading speed for a certain paragraph. There's so much that you can gain with it and it's, yeah, think again, uh, like a compiler, you're optimizing your code, basically. Then please use real words, uh, verbs. That's something that especially the developers uh, often do. SSH into the administration node. That's that's a real word sentence in a pull request from a developer. Um, and changed it to connect to the administration node using SSH. Um, this also has the the nice little benefit that you avoid uh, the capital SSH. I mean the command on the command line is called SSH lowercase at the beginning of the sentence you're running into a problem. If you write it lowercase at the beginning it looks stupid. So um, yeah, again, tiny, tiny little difference, but don't don't use... I mean, know that if you're familiar with a certain piece of technology, um, it's, it's very common to use uh, program names as, as verbs, especially I mean, in the Amer in the English language, you can turn everything into a verb, right? Uh, we can't do this in German, but in the uh, in English, you can do this. Please don't stick to stick to simple verbs. Stick to real verbs that everybody knows. And um, last but not least, order matters. Um, we have two sentences here. Refer to suzecom slash doc for more information or for more information. Oh. Oh, there's actually a capital R that shouldn't be there. For more information, refer to... So why is the second one better? Because you start reading, you s at the in the first half of the sentence you see what it's about, for more information, and in the second half, go there. I mean, it's it's uh, one ag uh, again. It's one of these these tiny little dif differences that speed up compiling in your brain by a microsecond. And um, I'm almost through. Oh, I'm quicker than expected, but that leaves us more time for Q and A. Last but not least, take your time. Write a draft. Sleep over it. Read it or even better have somebody else read it and then edit it. You know Stephen King, he's a famous author and he's, he once said to write is human, to edit is divine. The longer you stare at a text, the harder it gets, or the longer you work on it, the harder it gets. So take a break, sleep over it. Um, usually there's this 80-20 this rule. You can make a draft that covers 80% of the information or that is that is 80% good. You only need to improve the, the last 20%. And this can be very, very, very hard. So take your time. Um, do something else. Start working on something else. Write the second chapter or even write the third chapter, whatever. You can, you can even uh, leave the, the text uh, aside for a week 
it's actually better to look at the text after a week and then you think, oh, what did I write there? So take your time and uh, yeah, that should help you to solve most of the problems. All right, that's the six basic rules. We could make it even more rules, but I think that's enough and I think that's pretty universal. Um, are there any questions? Uh, rule number one was, uh, oops, uh, sorry, change the perspective. Um, are you a developer? Uh, formerly. Okay, you're a former, formerly developer? I'm a manager, so. Okay. I, I, the thing is, don't, if, if you are, if you were a developer, don't look at your program from a developer's perspective. On the one hand, you are the, the person who best knows this program, therefore you are the best person to document it. But on the other hand, you are the worst person to document it because you are the best person to know it by, by heart. You know the inner workings, you know what's under the hood, you're making assumptions and you cannot see from the user's perspective. And, and changing the perspective is, that's why it's rule number one, it's the hardest part sometimes and it's the most basic part. If you don't get this right, if you don't know your target audience, know what, who you are writing for. If you don't know that, then you have no idea. If it's, if it's easy, if you are writing an API documentation, then, then it's easy. You're a developer, you are writing for other developers, so the expectations are not that different. But if you are writing for end users, that can often be cumbersome for developers. And that's why in a perfect world, or in big organizations at least, you don't uh, have uh, the developers writing the documentation, but you have dedicated documentation writers or technical writers, just as you have uh, quality assurance. You, I mean, you're not supposed to test your own programs because you will always cheat. I recall uh, once upon a time when I was still working at Cola Systems, we actually outsourced some testing to India. And uh, Can I say the word click monkey? I, I, I know it's not politically correct, but these people there were not, I mean, they were professional testers, but they were by no means familiar with our software. And it's, it's unbelievable how many problems or bugs they found just because they were not familiar with it, just because they, they, stick, they, they strictly st stick to our instructions and we had just made certain assumptions, we had just skipped certain steps, or we had just assumed that everybody would be connecting to the mail server over uh, SSL and not over an unencrypted uh, connection, and uh, yeah, suddenly uh, that didn't work. I mean, try to, ch to change the perspective, or, or if you can't do that, um, yeah, try to get a real world user, if you have already written it, give it to a real-world user and ask them for feedback. Does that cover or answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Sorry. Any other questions on other rules or on that rule? So, how do you basically start creating the persona? So, you basically like uh, interview the users or roll out surveys or just make assumptions and test it if they are working with people. Um, frankly speaking. So the question was, how do you make up the personas, or how do you create the personas? Uh, I actually, I accidentally already gave the answers. In most situations, they will be made up. I don't think that, I think only very little projects have, have actual numbers or, or uh, user surveys or something, solid data that they can gather this, this on. So they will just make people up. Um, usually you can think of certain roles. Don't think of personas as the first step, but think of roles um, like the sysadmin, the uh, network engineer, or whatever. Um, and from that, like persona is even fine, more fine grained than a role. You could the next step would be okay. We are not thinking in terms of a sysadmin, but we have the 
junior sysadmin and the senior, or we have the sysadmin who just uh, who used to be a Windows admin and just got his first Linux training or so. That would be a valid persona, but as a first step, you just think about different roles and then you can make it more fine-grained. It, it would be nice if we all had that, that user data, if we all had surveys. I know that in Fedora we did that. Uh, I know that other, other organizations, I think Mozilla, for example, they, they do real-world testing. Uh, they, they test it with... with uh, Somebody said, it's so simple, even my grandma can install it, and they tested it on their grandma. So if you have a grandma who's willing to, to be your, um, your test animal, then yeah, go for it. Uh, is there something like a dictionary for the translation? Oh, great question. By the way, I, I'm... I'm a translator for several uh, previous e projects, and it would be so nice to have a operating system, uh, or in every operating system, the same nouns uh, to be consistent. Okay, I'm going to repeat the question for the, the, the people who are watching the stream. So the question was about, is there a dictionary, uh, especially when it comes so translation. I mean, first of all, is consistency in the, in the native language, and then it's consistency in the translations. You said you're a BSD translator. Ideally, things would be consistent throughout programs, consistent throughout desktop environments, consistent throughout operating systems. Unfortunately, the world is not perfect. Everybody has their own terminology, but at least within these projects, you usually have uh, consistency because they have some, some dictionaries. I can show you some. There are, for example, the GNOME translation guidelines, which are very uh, solid and, and cover a lot of stuff. Um, then there are, I think in XFCE we had the same, well, we had similar guidelines, but we had difference. Uh, so we started from the GNOME guidelines, but, but uh, reworked them slightly. Um, I think at some point uh, Ubuntu had their own guidelines. Uh, I mean, when it comes to German, uh, so Ubuntu always wanted to have this human touch, and they were uh, dutzing their users instead of Z. So that's, that's something very German that doesn't work in English, but it's, it's just two different forms of addressing a user. One is more formal and the other is more informal. And in Ubuntu we are all friends, so they use the informal uh, language, the informal, uh, uh, addressing the, the user in an informal way. Uh, if you have a, a particular question, I can so show you some dictionaries, but unfortunately there's not the, the one-size-fits-all dictionary. That's why we have a recycling bin and a trash bin, or, yeah. Um, but there are some resources that are very valuable. Um, I think the ultimate resource is the IBM Style Guide. That's just a giant dictionary. It's been published for I have no idea how many years already and it's yeah it's just massive. You can look up everything there. Um, there's also the Global English Style Guide. Um, that is more into translation as well. Uh, we have the, the SUSE documentation style guide, which might help you as well. Um, yeah. Um, any any other sources that I forgot? Oh, and yes, the plainlanguage.gov uh, website that I mentioned earlier. Plainlanguage.gov, plainlanguage one word dot gov. That's uh, the for one of the best res online resources. Not not necessary printed resources, but online resources is one of the best for, for plain language in general. Not necessarily for technical writing, but it already goes a long way. I think, I think... Are there any other questions? If not, I think we can just call it a day. Thanks everybody uh, for showing up. I think we all had a had a great first day of this vlog.
Um, yeah, and last but not least, it's it's a pleasure for me to be here, even though I am I'm I'm no longer a, a blue guy, but a green guy. Um, yeah, it's it's great to be here. I'm great uh, grateful to be to be back again. And uh, by the way, Suze is still hiring. If you have any questions, if you're looking for a job, we have over 300 open positions. Please talk to me. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you.